Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is Nina Granga. I am the gallery assistant at Book Arts. I just have a few introductions to make before we begin, a few announcements, and then we'll get this artist talk started. So for anyone who is unfamiliar with Book Arts, we're a community print shop and studio for letterpress, screen printing, book binding, and much more. We're a nonprofit organization and a working museum dedicated to preserving the book arts through collaboration and innovation, bridging antique equipment equipment and processes with modern art making techniques and celebrating the heritage of Buffalo's printing industry. Um, and our artist that we're spotlighting today is Shayna Agate. And Shayna is an artist and designer, teacher and organizer whose work focuses on relationships of power and difference in visual, social and political cultures. Her books have been, her books and prints have been exhibited internationally and his art his artist books are in libraries and collections across the United States. She is an art, an associate professor of arts, media, and communications at Parsons School of Design. Shana's work is also represented by Bookland. And the exhibition on view in our gallery right now, Things I Might Need, brings four artist book, four artist book and relief print projects together to examine power, desire intimacy and possibility at interpersonal and social scales. The work in the exhibition explores persistent questions in the politics of making provisional partial sense of everyday experiences, love, grief, nostalgia, violence through narrative and material forms. And just a couple of announcements before we begin. Um, if you haven't done so already, please introduce yourself in the chat as, long, um, as well as your pronouns. Also, if you have any questions for Shana, please write them in the chat as well. Uh, Shana's exhibition is going to be on view in our main gallery until June 18th, but it's also on view on our website as well. I'm going to include a link in the chat so you can see the online gallery. And also, if you're interested in purchasing any of Shana's work, um, the same link can be used to purchase them as well. And I'm going to pass it over to Shana. Thank you so much, Nina, and thanks for everyone at um, Book Arts for supporting this work um, and being so amazing this entire time. And thank you everyone who is here. I see many um, people who I know and adore. So I am very grateful to y'all for coming. And if I don't know you, I'm, I'm shocked and delighted that you're also here. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and uh, we were all talking before we started about being slightly out of practice with like a whole Zoom presentation world. So I've, I'm only used to meetings. So hopefully, hopefully I, I make all the things work properly. See how it goes. All right, you all can see a folder. Yes. Okay, delightful. So um, in the next sort of 25, 30 minutes or so, please feel free if you have questions that come up um, as I'm talking, as um, Nina said, to drop questions in the chat. Nina's going to be monitoring that. Um, there are going to be a few times that I read from the work that's actually in the show. A lot of my work is um, text-based, essentially, uh, which is still a surprise to me. Um, but I do a lot of writing that ends up in these books, so I will read some pieces uh, to give some context. But I want to start out by framing I guess sort of a general approach to the, the way that this work kind of is situated and, and the work that I hope it, uh, the work it does for me and the work that I kind of hope it does in the world. So um, the title of the show comes from this folder, uh, which you can see on the screen here, um, which is one of a handful of things I stole from my mother's house after she died. Um, and this is work, all of which is situated in relationship to these Things I wrote down now many, many years ago on a whiteboard, so long ago, in fact, that it will not erase. And so now it's this sort of artifact that I carry around with me from place to place. Those of you who work with me may or may not have seen it in my office where it lives right now. And it's a series of notes to myself that I made uh, when I was working on um, uh, pieces that none of which are in the show here, but which sort of led to this, this body of work that's in the show. And so I'm going to just. Um, for the purposes of kind of introducing these two ideas, read these two quotes that are that are on this whiteboard. Um, and the one on the left in blue is from Avery Gordon, who's a sociologist um, who writes about um, haunting 
kind of as a social presence um, and, a, and a political presence. And this quote is from her book, Ghostly Matters. And she writes, to be haunted and to write from that location, to take on the condition of what you study is not a methodology or a consciousness you can simply adopt or adapt as a set of rules or an identity. It produces its own insights and blindnesses. Following the ghosts is about making a contact that changes you and refashions the social relations in which you are located. And a lot of my work ends up uh, coming from a quiet place. Um, I am also a designer. I, I work with uh, social justice organizations and educational institutions, and a great deal of my work in the world is, is deeply collaborative. But most of the work that I do um, for my artist books, I do very, very much on my own. I think most of the time that I'm doing it on my own. It turns out when I stop to think about it, that I am also kind of always in conversation and, and nearly always with one form of ghost or another. And so I take this kind of learning from Avery Gordon's work and thinking about what it means to actually be able to be in conversation with um, and altered by the, the voices and the, the um, ideas that we, that we hear from different places. So I'll talk a little bit about the way the archives um, along with um, sort of both, both personal archives and also more official archives shaped this work um, and the stories that I, that I try to tell through it or try to grapple with through it. The other quote that's on this board is from David Wonorovich, who is an artist um, and writer uh, who died in New York City um, in the early 1990s. And um, I'll talk a little bit about a piece of his, um, uh, uh, sorry, a piece of mine that engages with a, a sort of idea of him. Um, but he, this is from his journals and he is coming home from a night of um, having sex with some hot guy and having a lot of feelings about the guy and about himself and about being out in the world. And he writes, ain't it always a silly mess of senses really now? All this should have been spared from the typewriter. I wonder if I'm alive years from now, will I appreciate this or scorn the very idea of it? This self-searching in the face of a world that kills people with bombs. And I think this question is also one that I struggle with all the time in my own work. Um, in many ways, the ideas in my work sort of um, dangerously dabble in nostalgia. Um, I wrestle with and struggle with um, ideas of desire that, um, that rest on many surfaces. Um, and so some of my work is also thinking about ways to push myself or force myself in some ways to, to, to be more deeply in the questions um, that are in that work. So in these archives, um, and this, this is, um, I will show you a handful of things that inform the pieces that are in the show. Um, and this is a letter from the Baseball Hall of Fame, which has a remarkable archive for anybody interested in baseball, um, in which uh, the president of the American League is writing to, um, a group of um, umpires prior to their first trip to Yankee Stadium in 1946. And he says, the attached bulletin is self-explanatory. On your trip to Yankee Stadium for the opening game of Monday, April 29th, please make a check to see whether or not the bat rack, which was on the playing field in front of the visitor's bench, has been removed. If not, it will be necessary for you to make ground rules. Also, excuse me, also, Check to see if the foul poles have been moved back off the playing field. Kindly advise yours very truly, President. So the, the work um, that I am gonna talk through today is informed by this idea um, of how it is that we make sense of things that we often can't control um, and the ways in which that um, works across a, a range of ideas that, that flow through my work. Um, the idea of the ground rule, which is sort of fundamental in baseball, um, is, a, is a, a set of rules that change year to year that are meant to govern the play in a given field. And I'll talk in a little bit about why I became so obsessed with ground rules um, when I talk about the book that is called Ground Rules. But right now I introduce this letter because I think it's really about sort of wrestling with my own desires for wrapping things up, for making things clean and easy, for having things be sort of sweet and make sense. And I'm interested in this idea on, uh, uh, of, of sense-making and how um, archives, how histories, how following the ghosts 
allow us both to um, create tighter or clearer stories of how things have become the way they are, and also routinely sort of blow those stories back open. Before I move into talking about the work, I wanted to um, talk about this, uh, the sketches that I've made on the way to this work. What you're looking at is a map of the freezers that my mom left behind <laughs> when she passed away. And my father, my stepfather and I were trying very hard to understand what all the things were that were left behind. I was also looking for projects. I went through many, many boxes. I went through many, many closets. Um, and ultimately I came to the freezers, which I think were organized according to a kind of internal logic that my mom knew deeply, but that um, I knew not at all. And since I knew I would be living there with my stepdad for some time, I thought that we should know what was there so that we might eat. Um, as many of you who maybe have lost people know, eating after death is not always easy. Um, and. I made this really to be a, a useful map and tool so that we could find stuff if we wanted to eat, but it came to stand in for a kind of understanding of the order that I was trying to create in the world um, in that moment. So it, it ends up being sort of a precursor to the books, um, to many of the books that are in the show, even though some of the books sort of uh, are from before this moment. So this is a question that I think is informs my work. It doesn't come out of, a, of an artistic context in particular, um, but the geographer Ruth Wilson Gilmore writes, how to ask and answer questions and hear the world in our asking and answering is the task before us. And I think that kind of quietness, um, that time spent with artifacts and materials and ideas that are not mine, but help me to make sense of my own in this work um, sort of resonates in this question. So there are four pieces in this show, um, one of which, this one that you're looking at now, is quite old, as a matter of fact. Um, and it is a piece um, that really grew out of my attempt to wrestle with the idea of how, um, how whiteness, how gender, and how family history um, build ideas of who, who we are meant to be and what we are meant to do. Um, uh, in the world. This is um, like many of the stories I tell told from a, a perspective that um, is deeply rooted in the way that I was raised um, in the United States in the Pacific Northwest um, in the 1970s and 80s um, at a time when uh, in many ways, not unlike the time we're living in now, when the specter of white supremacy was ever present, but the idea that we were somehow beyond that time um, was, was also typically vocalized. And I was interested in this um, book project, which has a text inside that is really sort of rehashing um, family histories um, and, and sort of reckonings with race and with class um, uh, as a way of also thinking through my own um, racialized position and my own uh, gender and queerness. Um, in thinking about the ways that um, the prints, which you can actually see, thanks Mel, on the wall right there, um, uh, are engaging with this kind of story of um, how whiteness operates to, um, in, in, a, in a contemporary U.S. context, um, almost as, a, as, a, as a, a shield for the history of the United States. So this idea that we have um, surpassed or moved past um, this kind of white supremacist history um, becomes embodied in particular characters, particular figures. Um, and in this particular image on the screen, what you're seeing is um, a print that is a screenshot, in fact, from um, the Smithsonian Institution that is a sort of um, homage to um, Abraham Lincoln's top hat um, and the um, nickname he was uh, often called the great emancipator. So this work is, is um, in the show in part because it's a much earlier project where I'm wrestling with these same kinds of ideas about um, the, the role of, of privilege um, and how it intersects with, um, with experiences of violence um, to begin to shape our understandings of uh, the stories that we are told um, that are meant to sort of provide and produce meaning and what happens when those stories begin to fall apart. And in this particular instance, it's a story of um, whiteness as a um, as a sort of non-entity that uh, that fell apart as I became uh, more and more aware 
uh, as a young person um, of the, the violence of racism. The more recent work in the show starts with this piece called A Wrecking Ball to Make a Window. And Mel, I feel like I'm making you run around the gallery, so take your time <laughs> moving around there. Um, Call a Wrecking Ball to Make a Window is actually a, a line taken from a poem of a good friend of mine, L.B. Thompson, who's a remarkable poet who wrote a poem that she hated that had this line in it that I thought was amazing. And so she let me take the line because she didn't like the poem. I bet if she'd liked the poem, she would have let me have it anyway. Um, and Call a Wrecking Ball to Make a Window is a book that, um, that again, sort of wrestles with this idea of history um, and the idea, again, of nostalgia. So this is the piece that I mentioned earlier that seeks to sort of trace a set of connections between me and the artist and writer, David Wonorovich. Um, Wonorovich was a, um, a gay white man living in um, New Jersey and New York City um, in, from the 1960s to uh, till he died in, in the early 1990s. Um, and the book seeks to trace, and you can see this in the image, seeks to trace, um, his movements through the city and my movements through the city. Um, we were not actually in the city um, in overlapping periods, except in the 1970s and the 1990s, very briefly. Um, I was born here in the, 19, in, in the 1970s and he died here in the 1990s when I was back. Um, but the, as I was working on this book, one of the things that became clear was that the island itself of Manhattan became kind of another character in the story that I was writing. So I'm gonna read a brief, piece from this, if I can get all of these things to operate properly, um, that speaks to some of the themes in this work. So this is from the first part of this book. In 1963, his dad came home with a New York City phone book as a souvenir. He and his sister and brother looked in that phone book for their mother. When they found her, she arranged to meet them at the bus and took them to her apartment in Midtown next to the Howard Johnson's motel where the cops would bust Angela Davis seven years later. There, he made it with a boy again. They were on the roof overlooking apartment windows inset and up high. Maybe they saw people brushing their teeth or standing at the stove, abandoned work tables and ironing boards, a card game. On the surrounding rooftops, he and this young man might have seen old box springs and five gallon joint compound buckets as they leaned in to kiss, if they kissed, and maybe an old metal table with a couple of chairs. Just before his shirt came over his head, he might have noticed that every bit of the city ends up home to someone, even for a minute. And if he did not notice then at nine or 10 years old, he would come to know it well. In 1963, your family could put you in an insane asylum for being queer. To prevent this, he wondered if he might kill the boy or kill his own family. But then the boy touched his chest again and he forgot about murder. Instead, he went to the library to look for fag in the stacks. The Holland Tunnel breathes regular like clockwork, like tunnel lungs. Every day since 1927, thousands of cubic feet of soot strewn air has risen above the tailpipes and windshields, swept up into vents by 84 high powered fans like jet engines sucked up and out, every bit of it replaced from below with fresh Hudson air pulled from the New York, New Jersey Marine border every minute and a half. Hustled through those fans set into two towers of art deco brick and metalwork, one for the Jersey side, one for the city. These towers turn over a tunnel's worth of poison air every 90 seconds, saving the lives inside each vehicle at least twice in a crossing. In the winter of 1974, he made his way back to New York City just as I was being born there. In a journal, he described this trip in two parts. He was picked up by two teenage boys in a truck who toted shotguns, threatened him and held him hostage, all the while moving east from California. And then upon freeing himself, he climbed into the car of one of Ken Kesey's merry pranksters who took him the 1400 miles to New Jersey where he stepped up on the front porch of his family's home and told them he was queer. At least some of this driving, he says, was through the snow. So when he took leave of his family and headed across the river to New York City, he would have been just in time for my cocktail hour arrival at St. Luke's Hospital on the Upper West Side one Tuesday in December. So in this book, when I first started working on it, Mostly what I was was obsessed with David Monarovich, which isn't that interesting and also definitely does not make me um, unique. Um, there's been sort of a, a, a resurgence of interest in his work. Um, 
What I ended up wrestling with was the idea of that nostalgia itself, what it meant as a trans person um, to be fantasizing about a time um, in which some kind of queer desire was in my mind theoretically simple, despite the fact that I had grown up queer in that very same moment 3000 miles away and knew that it wasn't simple as all, at all. Um, and so much of what this work ended up doing was being an opportunity for me to try to go into that sort of nostalgic desire and understand what it might actually be a desire for um, and to try to continue to do something that I think I've been doing in my work for a long time, which is to make sense of the kind of overlaps of histories of power, histories of violence, of landscape, um, and, and the complexity of, of sort of simple, straightforward desire, whether that's sexual desire or, or, or sort of desire to be a, a person loved in the world, um, uh, sort of all existing at the same time. So you can see these marks are, um, they're color coded and they have specific um, shapes, each mark and each of those marks represents a decade. And so the idea of the, of the, of the piece is that it takes my own sort of movements through Manhattan in the times that I have lived there um, and Wonorovich's from his journals where he talks um, in great detail about walks that he took around the city and overlaps them uh, so that one cannot tell whether they are my footsteps or his. The next piece that I wanted to talk about here um, gets into these two pieces that are more recent, both of which are, um, and this always feels a little bit awkward to say, uh, really about baseball. Um, and it, it seems weird to, to make art about baseball, um, especially for the like seven or eight years I've now been making art about baseball. Um, and it grows in part out of the way, the role that baseball played in the, the life that I shared with my mom when she was um, sick with lung cancer and dying and, and the sort of role that it took on in that sense-making work I was talking about earlier after she had passed away. Um, but it's also because baseball, not unlike Manhattan, not unlike the sort of complexity of um, things like race and racism and gender and queer life, um, baseball is, is both a, a metaphor that gets used really quite regularly and also is um, rife with complex politics. It is a metaphor for um, everything from the idea of America itself to um, the notion of war. Um, it, it, for anyone who watches baseball, you will see that the military is celebrated every single game. Um, and it becomes a sort of complex site, again, of, of a sort of intersection of, of desire and, um, and this kind of ongoing wrestling match uh, with how to live with things I love that also have this violence embedded in them. Um, what you're looking at right now is actually a, a part of the story that's in a book called Ground Rules that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but is a model of New Comiskey Field, which now has like seven different names. I think it's called Guaranteed Rate now, um, that uh, was actually built prior. That, so this model was built um, prior to the stadium being built. Um, and as you can see, it's in a wind tunnel. And it's there for these uh, smoke tests to try to understand where it is that the wind as it uh, blows through Chicago in this particular spot in, um, this, in South Chicago, in the South side, how it would affect the travel of the ball. And it, this becomes sort of a, a, a piece of, of the story in, in ground rules. Um, but this notion of control, this idea of being able to um, take something that is a game and control it so precisely that you could, that you would um, go to this length uh, prior to building a field became fascinating to me. Um, and the baseball field sort of became the subject of, of two of these books. And these are the last two things that I will show. So this is a book called Park Factors. And a park factor is an, a, a, a very weird statistic. Baseball is a, a game that is um, understood through statistics and has been for, for ages. Um, but, the, but a park factor is a strange statistic because it's completely relational. Um, so a park factor, see if I have the right image here. So a park factor um, tries to uh, explain or predict or, or give information about the relative likelihood of a particular kind of hit. So a, a single, a double, a triple, a home run, um, in 
in all the ballparks within the the within Major League Baseball or within either the American League or the National League. And the thing that I find fascinating about a park factor is that it doesn't exist except for in relationship to that likelihood in another place. Um, and the, the notion that, that a statistic would be completely relational and dependent um, was a really sort of compelling idea to me as I was thinking about the ways in which um, the body, my, my mom's body and my body, but also the bodies of the, the healthcare um, professionals with whom we worked with the other people in our extended family um, came into play um, and the ways that what was happening with my mom's body impacted what happened with my body, with my stepfather's body um, and with the lives of the people around us. So this piece is very short. I'll read it to you quickly. Um, it says, one ballpark is only more or less likely to make a good home for that slugger, that sinker ball pitcher, your big first baseman. Each has its microclimate of fences and porches and winds, but no one park has final say where the numbers are concerned. Not in the thin air of the mountains or the marine atmosphere of our low-lying port city where the cold hounds its way into your bones. There is no absolute park factor. Each park's odds are figured relative to the others subject to moves made elsewhere, out of sight. And what you're seeing on the opposite page um, are pressure prints um, taken from photographs um, of the drawers that my mom organized in the kitchen. So this is that reference back to the freezer maps. This is what I thought about when I wondered how the Tupperware, would be, the Tupperware lids would be arranged after my mom died. The parameters of this drawer under the coffee maker were obvious to her calculated according to reason and tolerances in the secret of her mind, a right way relative to wrong ways, other drawers, eventual needs, and thresholds known only to her. What if we got it wrong? After, it would be plastic lids adrift, out of context. My stepdad held up the silicone cold, coated cooking mat and asked me, where does this go? Not realizing it could go anywhere because once I returned to New York, it would be his kitchen after all. So these were ways for me of trying to make sense of, uh, like I said earlier, sort of the, the, the order of things and the, the ways in which the removal of a person from one's life sort of throws things uh, into disarray. Um, and in fact, threw in that, in that case, a, a sort of whole sense of space into disarray. And I became interested in this, in this desire to control things. Um, not, not only after my mom had died, but also in the, the act of, of um, trying to control cancer. So she died from lung cancer. Um, and I, I thought a great deal when she was sick and also after she passed away um, about what it meant that we tried to control um, her body, that she tried to control her body, that doctors tried to control her body, not obviously against her will. Um, and that we were all living with this kind of unknown thing, these, these, this sort of complicated intersection of knowns and unknowns. And this is where I think I wrestled for a very long time because nobody needs to read my journal, right? So I was not interested in making work that was so much uh, about me. Um, and eventually what became clear was that there was this metaphor that had kind of emerged in, um, in the way that my mom and I uh, really spent more time with baseball than we did um, sometimes talking about the cancer. And so I turned to baseball as a way, I think, of trying to make sense of this urge to control, this desire to know what's going to happen in a game that if you ever spend any time listening to people talk about it, um, is also celebrated for being completely unpredictable. Um, and so there's this sort of love of both how controlled and how counted and how countable it is and how out of control it is at the same time. And that to me seemed like a way to think through that experience. So you're looking at um, drawings and uh, ground rules cards that um, are again from that archive in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, all of which became kind of subject matter for this book that you're looking at now. And this is the last book I'll talk about. So this book is called Ground Rules. Um, and what you can see on the left um, is the wrapper, the container uh, for the book. And on the right, one of three spreads. Um, and, um, and thanks, Mel, is actually showing you the spreads on the wall in the gallery right now. Um, and the book is made of handmade paper um, with a watermark 
uh, that stretches across three pages um, that represents uh, one of the, the, the ballparks uh, that's talked about in that section of text. And then there's another um, sewn line that represents another ballpark. And so everything in this book, again, sort of plays on that idea of relationality. So I'm going to leave this up while I read one last thing from this work uh, that is actually about this letter. Um, and I will wrap up with that. My mom's diagnosis came on the eve of the baseball season. By early March, pitchers and position players had long since reported to spring training. And while the games are a little dull and they don't count for anything, all the speculation and hope has begun. The year of my mom's cancer was R.A. Dickey's Cy Young Award year. The Mets, my mom's team, lost often, but Dickey had his knuckleball working. He won by keeping hitters off balance, throwing butterflies, balls that floated unpredictably toward home plate, swept along by the air which moved them any which way. No spin, just the strange friction of air on leather and string. Usually the thing about a knuckleball is that it either works or it doesn't, and you have to have your feel for it, and you also have to have a short memory. For Dickie, God was how he handled this. He tried his best when it was his start, and sometimes it didn't go his way, and he would give it up to God and work his bullpen session and try again five days later. My mom loved Dickie, but not God. So she loved him by, quote, skipping over the Jesus stuff and watching every start televised on the West Coast. In Dickie's Cy Young year, my mom and I might have talked baseball more than we did chemo treatment regimens, CT scans, radiation. I listened to the Mets broadcasters at home and learned the nuances of a game I had not played with my own body. I memorized the details as I saw them unfold, base running, footwork, timing at the plate, the jump on the ball from the outfield. These were the simple inevitabilities of baseball, the lessons over, of over a century of practice and observation, debate and demonstration, how here everything was within the realm of experience and also anything could happen. You can come to the ballpark every day, Gary, and you never know what you're gonna see. The pleasure in that as counterweight, as reminder, my mom and I watched on our coasts and sent text messages. What a play and oh crap, what was he thinking? That sort of thing. In this way, the relative predictability of nine innings, five to six days a week, stood in for the relative predictability of three days of chemo, followed by a week of utter exhaustion, and then a week of something better, but still not great. Baseball stood in for what couldn't be predicted too, a shutout, a slump, fluid in the lungs, a day of energy, the dogs, the garden. Taking your spot in the rotation, getting set in the batter's box, a double off the wall. Baseball was an echo of the simple regularity of cancer and a reminder of what maybe we wanted to think about less or just on our own. Triumph, for example, defeat. These were private feelings and we didn't always see them the same way or have them at the same time. We controlled what we could, but there wasn't much of it most days. And some of what my mom knew she couldn't share. In Washington, Mr. Griffith did not leave it to God or to physics or his farm system. When he wanted to see more home runs for his national squad in the 1949 season, he just built box seats to bring in the left field line. Those seats filled in on opening day, fans watching from what was once the outfield grass. But try as they might, the home team's right-handed pull hitters couldn't turn on pitches to send them over the short new wall and the lefties did no better. As the early spring wore into late spring and opposing teams came in from Boston, Cleveland, Philadelphia to do what Washington mysteriously could not, Griffith noticed those new seats weren't filling up and he had them torn out. The papers and their sports writers called him on it. They wrote clever puns and put downs in 15 to 20 lines of type here and there near the box scores. They suggested Griffith's real motives could be diagnosed through the numbers, the statistics that even then gave baseball's narrative power. Two months into the season, opponents had hit eight home runs to the left. The Nationals won. The grass, worn out and rubbed down from the wood and weight of bodies, even a relative few, took some time to recover, but it did. The left fielders walked the gray-brown grass in the heat of early summer, noticing a difference under their feet, perhaps, a thinness in the ground when their spikes dug in, when they leapt at a ball or squatted down between pitches. And then the grass itself, as good a metaphor for baseball as baseball is for everything else, greened up and revived, despite Mr. Griffiths. 
In the American League summer meetings just 10 months prior, the owners had discussed this particular form of gamesmanship, not unique to Washington, with Mr. Herridge and the commissioner, who made his position clear that this being an issue left to the leagues had the least to say in the matter. Quote, do not think you ought to change your field after you start playing your games. I wish you fellows would all agree that you would not change the size of the field after you go to war with each other. And so this is the last thing that I will say about this. And you can see a close up of the, of the stitching here and the printing, this letterpress printed, is that baseball really does end up becoming in so many ways a metaphor for war or war a metaphor for baseball. Um, and this is where um, I discovered another overlap. And that was the overlap between war and cancer treatment. Um, I learned that mustard gas was actually the source of some of the first chemotherapy treatments and began writing about and thinking about the ways in which um, the idea that uh, cancer is a thing that must be battled, um, that the body of the cancer survivor or the person who dies from cancer is a battleground on which that must happen. And the language that people use to encourage people to fight and to win um, really brought me all the way back to that first kind of reckoning and thinking about the, the weight and the violence of white supremacy, the weight and the violence of a kind of American sense of progress and the sort of constant sense of war. Um, so I will, I will uh, leave you to read it on your own at some time the story that is in the book about uh, the Houston ball field, which really invests in this um, kind of idea. Um, including the use of the material used to, to the advertisement of the use of the material used to create bomb bay blisters and jet fighter canopies in the ceiling of the Astrodome. The last two slides I'll show before I close. Um, this is a piece that I'm starting to work on now because apparently I'm going to keep making work about baseball forever, despite the fact that it's slightly embarrassing. Um, and this is a piece that grew out of one other sort of fascination that emerged from that archival research, which is that the designer, the, well, the, the, the idea person behind both the Astrodome and um, the, Queens, the Queens sort of campus of the World's Fair, which included what was Shea Stadium, which was where the Mets played. These are the, the homes on the left and the right of two uh, 1962, I think it's two um, expansion teams, the Houston Astros and um, who started out as the Colt 45s um, and the New York Mets. And Robert Moses, who any of you from New York will likely recognize that name, uh, design, uh, was one of the people who was involved in the building of Shea Stadium. And Judge Roy Hofheinz was involved in the building of the Astrodome and each of them on separate occasions, unbeknownst to each other, claimed as their muse, um, Emperor Nero um, and his building of the Colosseum um, as a way of talking about the importance of these stadiums. So this, this project I'm working on now is trying to think about that narrative of empire and this idea of men wanting to build things in their image and what that, um, what that, what, what horrors that produces. So that's, that's kind of what I'm, Working on now, this is going to be a large scale woodcut. Um, and uh, I will leave us with that. Thank you very much. Okay, so I have a few questions, Shana, and this is also a reminder for everyone if you guys have any questions, please add those into the chat now. Um, yeah, so we've got a few. Um, so this is actually my question. Your exhibition is so honest and vulnerable. I was wondering, did the vulnerability in your work, was that, did that come easy to you or was it <laughs> difficult for you to work through and incorporate? Nina, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, thank you. Um, so I don't know that it's actually ever easy. Um, in that sense, I was I was joking with some people at my job recently. I think it was yesterday. Um, someone brought their brand new baby to work and said that the the baby might cry in a meeting, and I would be like, "Well, the baby's not gonna be the first one to cry in a meeting this year." Um, and I and I think that um, I think that in many ways this work, and I guess this is what I mean, you know, right? Like I wrestled with making this work because I do think it's important for work to be about more than me and my feelings. 
And yet I also know that uh, if I can find a way to engage the, the lived experience that I have in the world in a way that, that has the capacity to overlap with other ways of making meaning, um, that, that I think, and this feels like such a strange statement to say, right? But I, I'm pretty sure that that's the point of making art. Um, so I, I think that the, 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 this, this work, um, I think has a kind of vulnerability to it because I don't know what else to make, I guess. Um, and I think sometimes that need to connect it to an understanding of, of, um, or my, my, you know, my sort of political understandings, right, of power, um, my own work as a, as a, prison and prison industrial complex ab abolitionist, right? All of that ties in here as well. I mean, I think the idea of being able to have something as straightforward as um, love and desire be a thing that does not result in violence, um, uh, but also is not result in, um, I don't know. I mean, it was cute watching baseball players with their rainbow hats on the other day. And yet it's also a little bit horrifying, right? Because I, I know that's not going to stop people being killed in the street. So I, you know, I think for me, like that's what this work ends up ends up being about is like, how do I, how do we live in this world? Like, how do we, how do we do that? How do we do that work? Thanks for the question. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so I have a question from Therese Quinn. Um, Tree says, hi, Shana, great talk. I'm wondering if you have thoughts about the different ways that baseball stadiums affect their surrounding spaces and communities. I'm thinking of the difference between places like Fenway and Wrigley Field that are in the neighborhoods and the case of Wrigley slowly absorbing the neighborhood in comparison to others that are remote where people live. Thanks, Trees, and thanks for being here. Um, yeah, Chicago's such a weird baseball city when you think about those two stadiums, right? Um, I guess stadia, is that the proper? Um, so there's um, there's actually really remarkable scholarly writing about the, the, um, the ways that sports stadiums um, destroy communities. I mean, just to put it, you know, bluntly. Um, and I think Wrigley's a really interesting example of that now because it's the kind of stadium that in the past would have been you know I mean literally Fenway and Wrigley are built into the blocks they're on like the reasons they have such weird dimensions is because they had to fit into a space that was already there unlike um, that image that I showed of of New Comiskey guaranteed rate the cell whatever it's called um, that you know was built into a spot, same as as uh, City Field, where I spent a lot of time, was was built into a parking lot, um, and so I think that the 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 idea. So, Trees, I I won't do this, but I could talk about this for hours. Um, so that one of the things that's fascinating about this research is that you know, so most of the the um, sort of folks who write about this from an urban planning perspective are, are thinking about and talking about baseball stadiums or not just baseball stadiums, but uh, sports stadiums as, um, you know, essentially engines of gentrification. And I think we see that throughout the 1980s and the 1990s for sure. Um, one of the things that I'm really curious about in this woodcut kind of project that I'm working on now is that both the Astrodome and Shea Stadium were intentionally put in suburban, sort of it was at the beginning of suburban sprawl. It was at the introduction of the highway, sort of the, the preeminence of the highway and the car as a primary way of traveling. And if you, um, the beauty of archives is that you can see all of the promotional materials and all of the sort of um, the, the, like planning documents are all pointing to the idea that the future of cities is all about car travel, it's all about luxury, and it's all about being able to get in your car from one place, drive to a place, park your car, go into an air conditioned or otherwise luxury space, get back in your car, get back on the highway and go home to your suburban community. Um, and a lot of that, of course, is also deeply, deeply racialized, right? So it's all about moving white people through space to get from one spot to another. Um, and so the, the, the eras, I would argue that, I mean, I, I'm not a scholar in this way, but, but just based on the research I've done, the, 
the eras of building baseball stadiums first into the sort of city fabric um, and then into the outskirts really goes along with that same, I'm looking at Gabrielle on the screen right now because this is what she writes about, but not the baseball stadiums, but about cities, right? So uh, goes hand in hand with the idea of kind of who is gonna live in cities and who is not gonna live in cities. And you can see the movement of baseball stadiums in particular in cities and out of cities with white people, right? So white flight moves them out of cities and then white, white return, right? Urban renewal, et cetera, moves them back into cities. And these stadiums are huge economic projects that do that kind of work. And I, the last thing I would say is that this, um, the stuff going on with Wrigley, so where the, the person who bought the team, I'm totally blanking on his name, is taking over the neighborhood, right? Building a hotel, building, like literally taking over space and literally taking over the underground space in order to do that. So they've moved whole parts of the ballpark underground in order to be able, like the bullpens and other things, in order to be able to take over more space in, in the city and the neighborhood. Thanks for the question, Therese. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Rickett, thank you, Carolyn. I know there's Chicago people in the room here, yeah. Um, I, Nina, should I just go, I'm looking at the chat. I can, I can go through. Yeah. Um, so, um, I see Jay Elizabeth and Radhika's questions. Um, Jay Elizabeth and Radhika, thank you both for being here. Um, so Jay Elizabeth asks, I'm wondering how your pedagogical thinking contributes to the way you make books and cultivate a visual language around state violence, safety, and most resonant in me, grief. Um, Thank you, Jay Elizabeth. That's a fantastic question. Um, I have not thought about that before, I think. So here's what I'm gonna say off the top of my head, which is um, I feel like everything I make is always trying to work through ideas. And I think when I am most grounded in my pedagogical work, it is also about trying to think, think through things with people, right? Um, and so I think in many ways, the, um, and full disclosure, Jay Elizabeth, now a long time ago, uh, took a class with me. And so I'm, I'm thinking about some of the conversations that we had in that class. And I'm, um, I'm thinking about the, so there's this class that, that I designed in part because I don't know how to answer the question, how do we make work about um, prisons, policing and surveillance um, that is effective, useful, that does things. And how do we do that as people situated in different ways? Um, and I think that one of the reasons I designed the class to begin with was because I do not know how to do that work, despite the fact that I've been doing that work since I was in my twenties, um, that visual work, I mean. Um, and I think, that the, the way that I've maybe possibly ended up in, um, in, in writing so much in my work is in part because um, that, I think that writing is an act of reflection. And I think that for me, it's funny, I spent the day in, um, in a series of workshops about reflection in, in pedagogy. Um, and so it's making me think, uh, Jay Elizabeth, about the idea that um, being in conversation with people through that writing and being in conversation with the materials that inform that research um, is, is grounded in some of the same sorts of ideas that I think are the, the kinds of ways I try to, to lead um, or always end up leading um, my teaching uh, through questions. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that, that gets at the, at the question you asked. I'm looking at the time and I'm going to move to Radhika's question. Um, uh, so Radhika writes, uh, asks if I can speak more about, um, thanks Jay Elizabeth, it, more about the form of the book itself in relation to my preoccupations of death and dying, gaming metaphor and desire. Um, Radhika writes, I'm thinking particularly about how books once upon a time could be opened and closed, not anymore. And I suppose not the book opened on a wall or in a gallery. Also a really um, amazing question that I don't know that I have thought exactly about. I think I've thought about it in this way, Radhika. Um, so I guess two things. One is that there's, a, there's an intimacy to books that is 
completely compromised by book arts <laughs> um, because of the way that exhibition works, right? Um, I think that the that question of whether a book can be handled or not is one that is, uh, you know, pervasive in showing books in galleries. Um, but I think that that the the form of of um, there, so there are two things about these these two particular books that are about um, death and dying. Um, the one park factors, which if you're looking at the image of the gallery is on the pedestal in the middle and is the accordion book. It um, is a, it's a binding uh, designed by a, a binder named Hetty Kyle who designs all kinds of interesting bindings. And um, it's a reversible accordion. So it has a spine that comes out um, and you can open it as a, so depending on where the spine is, you can either only see one side of the book or the other, or you can take the spine out completely and see both sides. And that's how it's set up now. Um, and so for me, I, I chose that binding for this. Um, I think because of that idea that some things are unknowable or unseeable that are sort of um, reserved or private, um, and thinking about that relationship of that idea of grief um, and that relationship to death and to um, the things we can never know after someone has died, which is also a subject of the text and ground rules, um, felt protected in a sense, but also kind of echoed in that structure. With the ground rules, it had so much more writing than I had planned for it to have. I just kept going and going. So the book itself got a lot bigger than I had originally imagined. Um, but the form of it came through experimentation. Um, I, was, I was at a residency at the Center for Book Arts in New York and took a class with a person whose name I'm forgetting, her first name's Maria, um, on the codex as a form. Um, and I just started, so she just had us like, folding a bunch of paper and playing with it and sort of thinking about the codex. And I ended up um, punching the, like a fake outline um, of, of the, the a ball field into the form and um, sewed through those holes and realized that it created not only that sort of um, design, I guess, or that, that kind of image in a sense, but that it also created a book that was held together only at the fore edge and only by a single thread. Um, and so ultimately, the way that I ended up making the decisions about that, that particular book, um, the watermark was almost accidental. When I first made that experiment, it had holes punched in it and then a sewn line. So there was sort of a, a vacancy and then a sewn line. And one of the other artists who was in this residency with me, excuse me, Beth Sheehan, who is a papermaker, was like, you know, it would be great is if you made a watermark. And I was like, what? How do you do that? So many years later, um, I got myself taught to do that and, um, and ended up making this paper, which was definitely not my original plan. Um, and so the paper itself is a cotton rag. It's actually really hefty. It's sort of hard to tear. It's, um, it's all sewn by hand. So it actually has to really hold up to the needle going through it over and over and over again. Um, but it has this kind of um, fragility to it. Um, in the, in the plainness, I guess, of, of the stitching. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that is that when I very first planned this, um, I thought the color of the ink, I thought I was gonna print in a really bright color because uh, I think baseball has this kind of bright greenness to it. Um, and it was 100% wrong when I actually went to look at it. And so the whole book itself, aside from that bright green cover, which is this paper made by a place called Cave Paper, um, it's all sort of fades away um, really easily. Um, and I think that then too became a way of thinking about um, maybe, both a, maybe both a kind of protectiveness, but also a, a way in which um, the thing itself just always feels so kind of fragile, not fleeting exactly, just fragile. I, don't, I hope that answers that question. And thank you for asking it. It's a wonderful question. And it's 6.59, look, that's perfect. Okay, well, thank you, Shana, for leading such an amazing discussion. And thank you again, everyone, for attending Shana's Artist Talk. Again, if you're interested in viewing or purchasing any of Shana's work, take a look at the link I sent in our chat. 
Um, also, as Rose stated, this discussion was recorded and it's going to be uploaded to Shana's webpage. So if you're interested in sharing or watching again, you can click the same link. Um, again, thank you and have a great rest of your night, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you for your wonderful questions too. I appreciate it.